So ladies and gentlemen, the time is now five after the hour. It is my honor and my privilege as your host to welcome you to injecting security into your DevOps strategy. This is a cyber strategy retreat executive roundtable hosted by Class LLC. We can only do this because of the support of our partners, Cobalt Labs, Checkmarks, and I guess we'll say that the National Institute of Standards and Technology is our partner because they're allowing Ron to hang out with us as well. The goal of this conversation serves two purposes. Purpose number one, we have collected a great group of thought leaders and experts to share their ideas about how strategy is going to incorporate considerations for DevOps. How are you going to build DevOps into your security program? How are you going to build good practices into everything that you're doing to execute successfully a new strategy or a new approach that people are using for applications for system developments and deployments. We're moving very far from the traditional approach for the waterfall model, where you sit back, people plan out everything, they deploy it in sequence, and there's no going back to make corrections. My premise and the idea that brought everybody together was that if we're going to do DevOps, we might as well do it securely, and we should use it to create an environment that only allows the developers who don't know much about security to deploy code that is safe, that is trustworthy and satisfies the requirements of the organization so that we manage our risk effectively, so that we reduce the risk that we're exposed to, and so that we set everybody up for success so that we can focus on the mission rather than allowing security to be a speed bump or a roadblock in the process. Now, in honor of Veterans Day, I did want to take a moment to recognize all of the veterans who have served in the United States Armed Forces. And if we go beyond Veterans Day, November 11th is the national and global celebration of Armistice Day or the Day of Remembrance, depending on the country that you're coming from. Many countries around the world recognize the cessation of hostilities declared on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918 to end the Great War, which was also known as World War I. The United States joined this celebration until 1954 when we stopped calling it Armistice Day, and we started calling it Veterans Day to recognize the sacrifices that people made in the aftermath of World War II and the Korean War. The United States passed legislation in 1954 designating the 11th of November as a national holiday, and instead of recognizing people who died, like we do on Memorial Day, we are recognizing everybody who has made the choice to serve in our U.S. Armed Forces that includes the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Army. I'm honored to be counted as one of more than 21 million veterans who are living today in the United States, and hopefully all of us are celebrating this day. Prayerfully, people are well, and they are enjoying all of the festivities and the recognition. Ron and I are you two veterans as hosts today, but there are tons of veterans out there, so please do take some time to remember them. Execution has not been perfect in all of the military events that the United States has been involved in, but I do think it's worth sitting back and reflecting and recognizing all of the men and women in the U.S. and around the world and other militaries who have sacrificed their life, who have been willing to lay it on the line in defense of freedom and liberty everywhere that that need exists around the world. So officially, as your host, it is my privilege and my pleasure to say to you, Happy Veterans Day, and thank you for joining this session on such a great holiday. Now for our speakers, we do have a great set of speakers who are lined up to contribute to the event. Ron is a fellow at NIST, and instead of reading everybody's bios, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, but I do want you to know who's speaking for us today. So Ron Ross is a dear friend. We go all the way back to when I was at the Centers for Disease Control at the beginning of FISMA in 2002, and we have continued to stay in contact and work with each other throughout all kinds of iterations of the 800-53 and all of its revisions. We both also continue to support the Information System Security Association and all of the many chapters of the association around the world. Um, Ron has been on a tear this year, you would think that with the inability to travel because of COVID that he might have relaxed, but I think he's actually doing more events in 2020 than he has done at any other time. Um, Carolyn Wong and I have been hanging out on the conference circuit and speaking and thinking and coming up with great ideas throughout this year. She has a wonderful blog that focuses on people in InfoSec 
that rather than rather than thinking about the work that they're doing is the person behind the work and what makes them just a human that is contributing great value to the world. Um, many people should know Stephen Gates. Not only is he a security evangelist, but he's also a strategist. He has great ideas. He talks about wonderful things all over the place. And again, my objective here is just to give you a highlight of the great people that we've brought together. And then for the purpose that it serves, I'll let each of our speakers introduce themselves and share what they think you should know about them that adds credibility to the conversation and what they're bringing to the table. Um, for my part, I'm the Managing Director of Cyber Leadership and Strategy Solutions. We spend a meaningful amount of time talking to people about strategy, which influenced the selection of the topic for this conversation. Class LLC is also the company behind the Cyber Strategy Retreat. Mm -hmm. So to our alumni of the event, thank you for coming back for another session. Whether you have joined one of our webinars previously or whether you've been to one of the two conferences that we delivered this year. When we talk about injecting security into your DevOps strategy, one of the things that's going to be valuable, especially when you think about this from the learning perspective, is to understand what is the big idea with DevOps. I selected Microsoft's definition, not because Microsoft is necessarily the best company in the world. People have different opinions, especially given some of the troubles that they've had with patches and updates, but Microsoft has very mature documentation and very mature processes for executing what we're talking about when it comes to DevOps. Um, I guess we'll have to go back and update the recording. Somebody started sharing as a um, matter of protocol. Screen sharing is available, but don't use it because you'll lose my slides and my slides are supposed to be guiding us. This is what happens when you do a live event instead of a um, pre-organized session for the public. And so, as I was saying, going back to the official definition, I selected Microsoft as the organization that is going to represent our definition of dev operations. Their definition is generally understood and lots of organizations adopt similar approaches, but the idea is that you are going to transform and influence the development lifecycle where you're bringing operations people and development people and your IT infrastructure managers and everybody else who is part of the ecosystem to develop and facilitate a methodology to roll out applications at a speed that makes sense. Speed that makes sense is an important concern because the way that you approach this is going to be influenced by the resources, the capability and the maturity of your organization. And a lot of organizations overlook security and the role that security plays inside the process. This is the reason that we want to spend our session today talking about the way that you inject security into your DevOps strategy. Ideally, you want to create a situation or a framework whereby the only way to deploy code or the only way to deploy a system is to deploy something that is secure, that is resilient and is trustworthy. And that's going to be based on the configuration of your infrastructure. It's going to be based on your governance practices that are in place. It's going to be based on the adoption that everybody has and accepting the standard, accepting the practices, and then using an approach that satisfies the requirements that you're trying to accomplish. Now, when we talk about strategy, people throw the word strategy around all the time. By academic definition, a strategy is just a general plan to achieve one or more long-term goals or overall goals under conditions of uncertainty. And so when you talk about uncertainty, that is the key objective when we have this conversation. There is some level of uncertainty about the risk that you're facing or about what your applications are going to encounter. And if we talk about this under the umbrella of risk management, accepting that one of the objectives of security is to manage the risk an organization is facing, it is effective to have some kind of plan to manage the uncertainty that your organization is facing. When you transition from the idea of strategy into the activity of strategic planning, strategic planning is going to give you a structured approach to transition from where we are today to where we wanna be in the future. Now, lots of organizations are just jumping into DevOps without thinking about it, without providing a plan, without having a roadmap that says, what are we going to adopt? What are the tools that are acceptable? What are the frameworks that are going to guide the process? And thinking about security in conjunction with your digital transformation strategy, or thinking about security in conjunction with your IT operation strategy is going to create an environment that makes your organization 
its applications and the data that you're protecting more resilient to any kind of compromise or any kind of outage or any kind of disruption. Ultimately, everything that we're doing is focusing on what does it take to understand the environment? How does it operate? The risk that we're exposed to and the steps that we're going to take to avoid some kind of harm or disruption that is going to affect operations, that's going to affect our financial standing because of fines or some other consequence, or is going to affect our reputation. If you have everything together under a good framework, and if that framework supports proper execution, you at least have more confidence that you're going to operate in an environment that you understand, or if you have an incident or an event, you understand what's happening, how things should be, and you respond as quickly as possible. Now, before I hand it over to Ron, and he is going to introduce us to some of the things that NIST has been doing, one thing that you should keep in mind is the role and the function of the strategic planning process. If you're going to inject security into your DevOps strategy, there has to be some kind of roadmap. So when you're developing your strategic plan, the process begins with establishing context to ensure the situation is understood. How DevOps is going to work in my organization is going to be very different than the way DevOps works in other organizations, and doing that context establishment is going to be an important activity so that you know what resources are available, what gaps exist, and what additional steps need to take place so that you can achieve the outcome that you're looking for. Next, you want to look at setting long-term goals and objectives. These should be smart objectives where they're measurable, you can account for them, they're realistic, they're time-based so that you understand where are we going and how do we know when we get there. The root cause of issues often is going to help drive some kind of decision. If we're not using DevOps today and we want to use DevOps tomorrow, what is the root cause that is, that is leading us to make this transition in our approach or this transition in our strategy, which then allows us to start to identify solutions to implement? DevOps is not just something that you run out and do tomorrow because it sounds fancy, it sounds sexy, and it sounds exciting. It does require a plan so that you can identify the resources, the capabilities, the knowledge and wisdom of your people, and bring all those things to produce a product, a service, or a result that is going to satisfy the needs of the organization. And this strategic planning process in the midst of it is going to help you identify your requirements for choosing viable options, is going to help you identify measurements to track your success, and it's going to help you understand what is everything that I need to know to recognize whether or not I'm accomplishing what it is that I set out to accomplish. Now that I've given you the condensed version of Strategic Planning 101, given the role that Ron is playing at NIST and the work that they're doing with system security engineering, he is a great person to follow with his ideas his thoughts and his experience about what people really need to do to get a hold to get a hold of this DevOps thing and to do it properly to support their organizations. Ron, it's my pleasure to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. Can you hear me okay? I wanted to make, make sure we do our little audio check here. We're good. Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Well, I'm Ron Ross from NIST, and I've been at NIST for, it's hard to believe, uh, 23 years now, and it's been a joy every day to, to work in a great organization with all my colleagues and especially great to work with all of my colleagues in the private sector. And uh, again, I wanna thank Kian for hosting today. Uh, again, thank you for your service, Kian, and all the veterans out there. It's just a, an honor and a privilege to be doing this on Veterans Day uh, and, and remembering all of those great individuals that have served this country over 244 years to, to keep us free and allow us to do events like this today and to just be together and share these great ideas. So thank you for bringing this together, Kian. With DevSecOps, I think I would, would like to use my time today to set the context for uh, DevOps uh, and some of the things that we'll be talking about. You know, for the last, um, I think four decades, when you talk about cybersecurity, our strategy has pretty much been one dimensional. We we try to protect our systems to the best of our ability. We, we do all the safeguards, the security controls, and everything that we can do to make those systems as penetration resistant as, as we can. Uh, and then we go into a penetrate and patch type of mentality. Uh, and so what's happened over the last 40 years is that we're always looking at the new th the threats and we're looking at new vulnerabilities and we're kind of going through that risk assessment, threats, vulnerabilities, impact, and likelihood. 
And that worked pretty well for the first uh, few decades because our systems were a lot less complicated than they are today. Uh, when you look at what we're building in this tremendous innovation that's going on in the private sector, in the information technology area, it's, it's really breathtaking to see the capabilities that this great technology and our industries are bringing to us. It's literally trillions of lines of code today, billions of devices to include the IoT space, and all of that in a world that's moving from 4G to 5G connectivity, ubiquitous connectivity. That complexity is unprecedented. And it really, to me, is the heart of the problem that we're going to talk about today with DevOps. And when you think about DevOps, you might not think of it in these terms, but I've always tried to characterize um, the security problems as you know, the metaphors I use above the waterline, below the waterline. Most organizations and cybersecurity professionals work uh, above the waterline in enterprises. You do everything you can do to you know, do con good configuration settings, you put your encryption in, you do all you can do, that things you have control over at the enterprise. But below the waterline is where industry primarily plays. That's where they're building uh, the through systems engineering processes. They're building software and firmware and hardware. And they're bringing those things together in, a, in the context of a system which provides capability to enterprises. Now, when you look at complexity from, uh, as a computer scientist, I look at complexity, uh, this is a tax surface. The more complicated the systems are, the more opportunities you give the adversary for exploiting some of the vulnerabilities that you know about or don't know about, the zero day vulnerabilities. And the problem with complexity is that those number of vulnerabilities, both the knowns and the unknowns, are increasing at an exponential rate. And that's not any dig on the software developers. When you're building large and complex systems, there are always going to be vulnerabilities that come into play. They could come from not having good requirements. Yeah, Key, and you mentioned in the lifecycle process, you really have to start with your stakeholders, your mission business owners, and figure out what kind of technology do I need to support my mission, and then how am I going to protect it? And that should generate a good set of security requirements, but that doesn't always happen. Even if you do have a great set of security requirements, you then go into the development process, and things can happen during development, even with a good set of requirements. If you're not uh, using good um, systems engineering practices, best practices in software engineering and secure coding techniques, there are a lot of things that can happen in, in the development process that end up uh, giving you weaknesses and deficiencies in the system that can then be uh, exploited by, by adversaries, uh, threat agents, and those we call those vulnerabilities. Uh, if you do everything right on the requirement side and you do everything right during development, which doesn't always happen, but let's say you do, then we move to operations. And as we used to say in the Army, there's a term, we, you might remember this, key. it's called operator headspace. Uh, I can give you a perfect set weapon system or a perfect device and, you know, as humans, we have a tendency to mess things up even, you know, during operations. So there are things that happen uh, on the operations side that you have to always be concerned about with regard to security. So that's the context, I think, that I'd like to address DevOps and uh, DevSecOps today. Uh, it, it, there's a metaphor I use also called the black box. All that complexity, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a server or a supercomputer, it's all about computers, and, and the, wor the world we're building today is a kind of convergence of cyber and physical systems. In other words, all those computers in your automobile, they're driving not just the entertainment system, but they're driving the braking system, the safety critical systems. And this is why we're so concerned that whatever we build, we can trust. And I think that's really where we start to talk about this whole notion of, of DevOps and DevSecOps. How do we how do we influence that, that security side of the house during the development process, which can help us ensure that we get those uh, systems that have the great functionality, the innovation that we need, but make sure they're less susceptible to these continuing adversary attacks. So if you kind of fast forward, we've gone through this penetrate and patch one dimensional strategy. And I think one of the things that we're looking at at NIST in our systems secure engineering guidelines, and now we're going to be moving into the DevSecOps arena, is how do we uh, change that basic paradigm and say, instead of just having one dimension, what if we extended that to two or three dimensions where 
you do everything you can to make the system as penetration resistant as you can. And that means doing all the cyber hygiene, all the good things we know about. But what happens in those five or 10% of the cases where the adversaries get into your system, they breach, they, they figure out a vulnerability, the zero days they manage to stumble upon and they exploit that. What do you do then? And so that second dimension that I am envisioning would be something called damage limitation. Instead of an OPM where they get 22 and a half million records, what if they broke in and they only got 500 records? And the way I think that can be done, some of this technology already exists. Uh, some of it is on the cutting edge, on the horizon, but it's close. But it would be something along the lines of combining a couple of different things in the system architecture. The first one would be something that you and I've talked about, Kian, called zero trust architecture, zero trust concepts. You basically collapse the perimeter, and instead of doing authorization, access control, and uh, authentication at the, at the boundary, you do that on smaller and smaller resources within the system. So the analogy I use is that, let's say you have a lock on your front door. Bad guys break down the front door. They just rip everything off in your house. Or what if you had a vault in every room? It would be increasing the bad guy's work factor, so they would have to go through and get through every vault to get all of your valuables. And the same thing can hold true with zero trust architectures and zero trust concepts. You basically slow down the adversary. You make it very difficult for lateral movement, not just across the system, but across a transitive attack across multiple systems, which is what happens in many cases till the adversary finds the target of opportunity. If you combine that uh, architectural construct with the virtualization techniques that we already have, we're seeing uh, virtual machine technology has been around for a long time. We have micro virtualization now where we're, we're virtualizing smaller and smaller segments of the system. And the idea there is you, you decrease the adversary's time on target and you make it very difficult for them to have enough time to go through the attack sequence. If you can churn that system faster than the adversary can do damage, you basically shut them down. Now, if you combine these two different uh, concepts and approaches in that damage limitation dimension I'm talking about, it may come to a point where we don't have to worry about the threat space anymore. They're going to always keep evolving. It's dynamic. And we don't have to worry about the vulnerabilities to the extent we do because they have to operate in our space. Once they come into that system and we have the zero trust concepts, the architecture in place, and that, that really uh, micro virtualization, it's going to be a very tumultuous environment for them to operate. And so it may turn out that it, it shuts down their ability to complete these attacks. And that would be a, a game changer as far as how we defend our systems today. Ultimately, all of that leads to something that we call cyber resiliency. And that's really just like you're the human body. You're, you're, the human body is a, an amazing thing that we can withstand many, many different types of diseases and uh, things that are out there. But sometimes like if you get cancer, or if you have like COVID-19, sometimes the immune system is just not strong enough. But in most cases, it works pretty well. That's the world I think that we're going to try to define and articulate. And industry has a great head start in the world of DevOps because now we're not just talking about integrating security. With DevOps and DevSecOps, we're seeing that we're actually able to get inside that black box now. And we're able to do things in the development process that give us greater transparency. We need to have a better idea of what's going on in that black box because we have to trust it. And so you have to have uh, transparency and traceability uh, all the way back to the original security requirements. And that visibility will give us greater assurance and trust, trust in the technology that we're, we're going to be using. That we're, we, we're, ne we're never going to slow down innovation. We don't want to. We want to bring security into the world of industry so we can operate securely at the speed of industry. That's where this world is headed. And if you're talking about either national security interests or, or economic security, we need to jump on the innovation train because that's how we build better systems, whether it's a weapon system or a medical device or whatever it might be. This world of DevOps and DevSecOps gives us a great opportunity through agile development practices to bring our 40 years of security experience and best practices into the agile and these new types of, of development processes that can produce more secure components. So uh, that's just kind of an overview. We're gonna be right in the middle of this discussion at NIST and we're hoping in 2021 to produce the first 
DevSecOps framework, which would um, integrate a lot of the best practices of industry and some of the things that we're thinking about at NIST. So, again, thanks, uh, Kian, for having me today. And I'm looking forward to the open discussion after uh, Carolyn and, and Stephen uh, have their chance to talk about their vision. Yeah, and Ron, I appreciate the insights and thank you for giving us a preview about some of the things that are coming down the pipeline at NIST. Um, next, we'll hand it over to Ms. Carolyn Wong. Ms. Wong is one of my favorite speakers. She has been featured at multiple strategy, cyber strategy retreat events. She is often featured at even global and national events like RSA conference and other places. Her Humans of InfoSec blog, my opinion is biased because I'm on there, but in addition to me being one of the people, <laughs> it is a fabulous, fabulous exposition and conversation with numerous people who are doing great things in the security world. And so without further ado, it is my honor, it is my privilege, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Carolyn Wong, Chief Strategy Officer at Cobalt Labs, to share her insights and her perspective about injecting security into your DevOps strategy. Keon, thank you so much. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, the reason I'm here uh, talking about this topic, I actually started my DevSecOps career 15 years ago, leading information security teams at eBay and Zynga. These were some very cool places to be working in cybersecurity. In both cases, we were running online operations 24 by seven with millions of simultaneous users daily. Uh, eBay had an uptime requirement of 99.94%, and is one of the first major electronic commerce shops. It enabled strangers to transact with each other over the internet. It still does. Uh, Zynga was growing incredibly rapidly as an early adopter of Amazon AWS. In 2009, the Zynga game Farmville launched, and in just a few weeks, the game went from zero to 10 million daily active users. A few months later, it rose to 80 million daily active users. Seven years ago, I joined the, uh, as a BSIM practice leader. Uh, for folks that uh, may not be familiar with BSIM, BSIM stands for Building Security in Maturity Model. It is a descriptive model of software security activities. Um, I highly recommend that folks check it out if you're interested. All of the data is free online at www.bsimm.com. What I did at Sigital was I had the opportunity to meet with more than three dozen software security programs. Uh, and at each of those companies, uh, meet with about a dozen folks and them about how they do software security. Um, I went back and I took a look at our model, which at the time had about 112 or so software security activities that were observed and documented, uh, and, I, and I helped folks to kind of benchmark. Um, so it was really cool for me to see how a lot of different organizations approach software security. Some of these organizations were operating in a waterfall software development model. Others were working in a DevOps development model. Um, four years ago, I joined Cobalt.io. We are a pen test as a service company, and we build security software. Um, like many other DevOps companies, we have data-driven product-based teams. Uh, we value automation and failing fast. Um, a couple of my thoughts on DevOps, I think that the challenges are really twofold. Uh, challenge area number one is cultural. Challenge area number two is procedural. So challenge area number one, culture. Uh, we've got situations like Historically, traditionally, engineering and security teams, maybe they're a little reluctant to collaborate with each other. Maybe, maybe engineers are a little bit resistant to security processes and technologies. Uh, maybe integrating tools and processes can be very complex, uh, as well as it has been difficult to integrate slow security processes with rapid DevOps cycles. Now, procedurally, uh, because I work at a pen test company, I think a lot about pen testing. Procedurally, you know, in waterfall engineering, where you have code pushes that are larger and less frequent, traditional pen testing works fine. Uh, in an environment where, you know, you see uh, products getting a max of two or three updates a year, 
waiting a f for a few weeks for pen test results before each patch release, it doesn't cause problems, as, as Ron was saying, in the penetrate and patch model. Uh, however, this, this approach, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, for logistical reasons, for resource reasons, traditional pen test providers need weeks or months of notice in order to arrange a test. And, and so pen tests are seldom available on demand. Um, and so these must be booked significantly in advance, usually once or twice a year. This creates considerable barriers uh, to the effective integration of security within DevOps practices, uh, specifically, you know, even with weekly code pushes in DevOps, a product could be three or four versions along by the time engineering gets a chance to implement pen test results. Um, you know, sometimes code bases might potentially go through dozens of iterations between pen tests, and therefore it's likely that engineers are actually going to be introducing new vulnerabilities that are going to be active for some time. So, what do we do? I actually, I actually want to um, talk a little bit about how I think pen testing specifically can be used by DevOps organizations, and I think the way that different DevOps organizations use a methodology like pen testing, on-demand pen testing, is different according to the security maturity of that organization. So for a low maturity team, low security maturity, pen tests can simply prove to system owners that their product is open to attack. For a medium maturity team, pen test results can be used to convince engineers that building scanning technologies into the process is a good idea. Nobody wants to be embarrassed when a pen test finds an issue that could have easily been found by a scanner. Uh, and so security should really be supporting engineering to embed simple scanners into the workflows to make sure this doesn't happen. At a higher level of maturity, the purpose of pen testing changes yet again. At this point, basic issues should be identified by scanners as part of standard engineering workflows, allowing pen testers to focus on more sophisticated issues. Um, I think the last comment I want to make uh, here is that, uh, of course, pen testing isn't the only type of security testing. There are lots of different security testing tools and processes that should be used to identify vulnerabilities, including automated scanners and manual code reviews. So some tests are going to naturally fit into the pipeline and should be completed every cycle. Um, manual code reviews are an obvious candidate, but SAST tools are also fast enough to include. So some lengthy automated tests like those uh, performed by DAST uh, technology and funding tools may not be fast enough to build into the DevOps pipeline. Um, these kinds of tools are faster than a full manual pen test, but they could still take 12 or more hours to complete. So that, that makes them unsuitable for in-band testing. Um, and so like pen testing, uh, engineers can use these tools as regular out-of-band feedback mechanism uh, and implement those results into future code releases. Um, I'm also very much looking forward to uh, the interactive portion um, of this, but just wanted to share a few of my initial thoughts uh, as well as, uh, you know, share kind of my background so that folks know where I'm coming from. Hey, Caroline, you did a great job setting the stage. You know that you're an awesome speaker when you have laid the foundation for the next speaker to come up and be awesome. And so thank you very much for not only highlighting the value of penetration testing when you're doing DevOps, but also to lay the foundation for what Steve is going to talk or what Steven is going to talk about when he introduces to us some of the ideas that he has about the role that application security testing is going to play so that you have that level of trustworthiness and confidence that Ron was talking about when he introduced the topic. So with that, for the audience, it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce Mr. Stephen Gates, Security Evangelist and Senior Solutions Specialist at Checkmarks, one of our sponsors for this session. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, first off, Ron and Ken, uh, thank you for, uh, for serving our country. I too am a veteran. Uh, I spent 10 years in the United States Army under the Reagan administration and the uh, Bush Senior Administration, the first Gulf War. And and so I'm a little disappointed today, not that I'm not in this uh, conversation, but normally I would take this day off. It's something I've religiously done for many, many years. And I would go to the uh, parade in St. Augustine and uh, 
take my grandkids so that they could, you know, see see many of the veterans in the parade and stuff. But this year it's been canceled. But uh, it would have been a rainy event anyway because it's uh, it's rainy here in uh, South Jacksonville. So, so a little bit about myself. Um, here's a question to the audience: When was the very first commercially available firewall? When did it come out? What year? Anybody can remember that. It was actually 1994. And I'm talking about the commercially available. People started buying that. Checkpoint, VPN1. And to think about where we've gone, I guess that's if I do the math, what is that, 27 years? Uh, uh, almost, of where we're at today with regards to security. And so I'm a subject matter expert in just lots and lots of different technology, lots of approaches, being an engineer myself, hands-on, deploying the technologies. I always tell people I didn't invent the internet, but in the early 90s, I was actually going around to all the central offices all over the world, all over the country, and installing the fiber gear and the router gear and the dial-up gear and the DSL gear and everything else and to bring the internet to life. And quickly realizing that uh, security was something we did not design into the original, uh, original deployment. So what I really want to share today is being a practitioner, I think practical. And that's just the way I operate. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not about policy. I'm more about procedures. And really, really, what I want to share with the audience today is to talk about how do we embed security into DevOps? Because when we look at DevOps fundamentals, right, and we hear the terms values and principles and methods and practices and tools, and so that tells us there's tooling that's involved. And dev and dev sec ops, right? How do we embed security? It's going to require tooling. Then we talk about the CAMS model, the culture, automation, measurement, sharing. And that tells us there's automation of tooling. And that's a huge requirement into achieving dev sec ops. And but the problem is, is that when we look at the standard personnel ratios, where we're talking about hundred devs to 10 ops people to one security personnel, that's never going to scale. And, you know, traditionally, you know, we've always had that sort of dev and ops um, wall it's, or, it's, or even security wall where it's just like, oh, throw it over the throw it over the wall and it's somebody else's problem. And so how do we solve this issue? And we hear the term shift left. You know, what does that mean? How do we how do we shift shift in, in you know, in an in infinity eight loop? Right. That's what DevOps is about. We see the, you know, the icons with a, the DevOps loop. And so how do we do it? How do we inject security into your DevOps strategy? And so what I did about a year ago, I sat down, wrote a book on what I believe would be the best approach to integrating and embedding security into DevOps practices. And so I wanted to really kind of share that with the audience and I'm going to go as fast as I possibly can because there's a little bit of content. But first off, my perspective on DevOps is processes, connections, speed, agility, automation tools. It's really what it's that's really what it pertains to. And you know, we even hear the interact or the uh, you know, the hype cycle from Gartner and not you know, not trying to plug them or anything, but you know, the trough of disillusionment is probably going to be experienced by quite a few organizations. But when we're talking about security and DevOps, it's really my perspective is it all begins with AppSec policies. We got to have internal AppSec policies that state what are the acceptable and non-acceptable risk your organization is going to take? Because every organization, every piece of software is going to have vulnerabilities. And it acts as a pseudo contract between AppSec and developers. It basically says your responsibilities, my responsibilities, we agree. And it really defines what should be remediated first. Remember, you know, security is not necessarily about finding the bugs. It's about remediating the bugs. And then also it's very, of course, you know, these DevOps policies are very, very closely associated with DevSecOps. And it's the, the policies are also can be used to track our KPI. We need to adjust, you know, it's sort of a cylindrical process, even inside of our security policy, uh, you know, perspective. It's a cylindrical process. We have to continue to improve. Now, we know that these policies are going to conflict where speed, Right, they're going to conflict. And hey, I've got these policies. We can't release vulnerable code. That's going to slow down the speed of my development. And also, you know, security cannot be a roadblock to these processes. Now, once you define your policy, it should also dictate how you automate and integrate application security testing solutions farthest to the left, right? 
And here at Checkmarks, you know, we are an AST company. We develop many, many different types of application security testing solutions and developer uh, uh, tool sets and developer training for really that fits very, very well into DevOps. But again, once I define the policies and, and, and it dictates how I automate, but it also should dictate how I identify vulnerabilities, how I'm going to correlate the results, how do I remediate the vulnerabilities, and how do I manage and monitor my developer KPIs? Because if we're not getting better over time, it's going to continue to be a tremendous problem. And so when we think about where to automate, where do we automate application security testing tools into our pipelines? First off, where the builds are running in the build environment, we're pulling, uh, you know, we're performing code commit and pull requests. You know, the repositories today are the preferred place of putting. That's the farthest left we can get it is in the source code management tools. And then, you know, the world today is Git. It's all about Git today and, and really being able to provide that immediate dev feedback, right? Think about a developer. He's in his tools that he's normally developing software, you know, launches a scan, immediately receives results, tells him what areas that needs to be fixed while the code is still very, very fresh in their mind is extremely important. Right, this is actually going to speed up development and deployment and deli or delivery and deployment of, of these solutions. And there's all kinds of different ways of integrating AST solutions inside of the SEMs, inside the CI CD environments as well. Now, once you perform the activity of integrating the solutions, what you know, what kind of solutions do I really need and where do they fit? Well, first off, we have static application security testing, a technology that's been around for a decade and a half, and really implementing it into the code, the check-in, build, test, QA processes. Also, there's a, a new kit on the block. It's called IAST. And the reason why I'm calling all of these out, because the NIST that uh, 800.53, right, which Ron and team had worked on, I think it's great. It talks about SAS, it talks about uh, SCA, it talks about IAST but it really doesn't talk about how to implement them or where to implement them, where the best places are to actually get the results that everyone desires. And so when we're talking about IAST, which is interactive application security testing, that's in the test QA phase, software composition analysis in the build test QA phase, and we can't forget secure coding education. And it needs to be embedded directly in the development tools, into the IDEs. You know, a developer runs a scan, comes back, says, hey, this uh, there's a vulnerability in this line of code. You should be able to click on a button, jump to an a interactive module that trains you exactly about that vulnerability, teaches them how to quickly remediate that vulnerability. It's been proven that the retention is it, it's going to be long term. They're not going to continue to create these repetitive vulnerabilities. When we look at OWASP top 10, SQL injection cross-site scripting has been on OWASP top 10 since the very first version in 2013. And you're looking at that and you're like, wait a second, we're repetitive coding errors are a huge problem. How do we resolve that? It's through training. And that training must be in, integrated within the development processes themselves. Okay, so now that I've got my tools, I'm running my scans, I've got to be able to correlate the results. I've got to be able to look and say, hey, if I see a SQL injection it's with my SAS, running my IAS over here, and we, uh, my personal preference on IAS is a passive IAS approach, right? It's not a DAS SAS approach, it's a passive IAS approach, meaning an agent is orchestrated into the actual, uh, into the application. And during functional testing, the IAS is watching all the source to sync, all the inputs to outputs, and says, ah, I see a vulnerability. And if you can correlate those vulnerabilities across multiple tools, it's going to increase the confidential confidence level tremendously. And the scan finding is going to be very re reproducible, meaning you scan it again, you're going to see the exact same vulnerability. Now, the next one is really about remediation. Okay, so now I've got my policies and I've implemented my tools and I've got them automated. I know where to, you know, where I, I have them operating. I'm, you know, I'm correlating my results. Where's the remediation? The remediation must be defined in your policy that says exactly what you're going to remediate and how you're going to remediate it, right? What needs to be fixed and how to fix it. And we need to be able to prioritize our findings. You know, we've got criticals, we've got, you know, uh, high level, medium level, low level, information only. 
I need to be able to to basically you know filter through all of that noise and say these are the ones that must be fixed first and the policy drives that you know that, that remediation aspect and also having the best practices on how to fix that's very very important that needs to be identified in the policies as well and best fixed location you know we look at some of the tools out there today some of the static application security testing tools very nice they tell you exactly where the best fixed location is for a number of vulnerabilities. You fix it right here, you're going to fix a bunch of other vulnerabilities downstream and ladder lines of code. And it really, this is exponentially going to reduce an organization's risk. Because at the end of the day, the reason why we're doing all of this is to manage our, our individual risk within organizations, especially with uh, you know people like me that keep getting their PII data stolen, which is seems to be very repetitive. Um, and then finally, it's all about managing and monitoring our key performance indicators. And what we're monitoring and what we want to watch is are the amount of vulnerabilities decreasing and the rate of vulnerabilities are decreasing as well. And then the frequency of severe vulnerabilities must be decreasing also. And so if that's not the case, we need to go back up into the policy, change the policy so that now we're getting better over time in this very cylindrical fashion. And it really measures if your security program is effective. That's, that's the whole point of DevSecOps. It's really, we want security in development, but we've got to be able to measure it, right? And that's that's another thing too, is, is that measurement and matrix are, are critical. And then finally, it tells us, well, what are our developers? Do they need more training? Do they need more days off? Do they need some vacation time? Do they need some incentives? Um, and there's all kinds of ways to incent developers. And, you know, today when we're talking about COVID, you know, and we're thinking, you know, developers used to go to the office, sit in a cubicle, work with you know lots of management structure in place and now they're all working from home most likely at least here in many parts of the us and so appsec awareness has to be embedded and it really needs to be a channel of open communications with regulatory compliance we've got to be able to address that interesting thing when you look at pci dss the number of times that the word training comes out and it's not employee training it's developer training Right. It's not just the general employee. It specifically states that developer training is a key aspect of PCI DSS. And it really, AppSec awareness and training can raise the bar at scale. You find and fix in one go. That's the whole idea of training. It shouldn't be in a classroom. It shouldn't be doing, you know, online tutorials that are completely out of context to what problems the developers are dealing with daily. And what it does at the end of the day, I, I, I I don't think I will get anybody to ever disagree with me. It's all about faster, higher quality, and more secure releases. So that's my take on uh, on embedding dev set or embedding security in DevOps. If you want to copy the ebook I wrote, go check it out on check marks. It's a great read. I just gave you a very brief uh, brief outline of what actually is inside of that book. I think we started with a good foundation for what people need to be concerned with. We've completed part one, where we brought experts to the table to share their ideas and their insights about this thing called DevOps and how you inject security into your DevOps strategy. The second half of the session is focused on bringing the audience into the conversation. If you prefer to leave your camera off, please feel free to do so. Just like I tell my employees, there's no requirement for you to be on camera just because we're in a web session, but we do wanna hear your voice if you're willing to share. If you don't want to say anything and you don't want to be seen, the chat works. Please post your comment in the chat and I will facilitate distributing the questions to our speakers. For the second half of the session, my role is really going to be MC and facilitator rather than opinion dropper. But if anybody wants my opinion, I'm happy to follow up with you later. And what I will do to get us started is I will provide the first question so that people can start to gather their thoughts and we'll go in the same sequence starting with Ron, then going to um, Caroline, and then going to Stephen. For the audience, if we position this educationally, what is the first thing that somebody needs to do to get started with doing DevOps properly, especially considering the value that security is going to add to the approach, to the strategy, to the implementation of a DevOps program in their companies? 
Well, for, first of all, the, uh, fantastic uh, presentations, Carolyn and, and Stephen. And Stephen, thank you for your service. We kind of missed that the first time around, but I uh, wanted just to recognize that uh, before we move on. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, I think uh, Carolyn summed it up well in her presentation. She talked about culture. There's a cultural problem and there's a procedural problem. I think uh, Stephen carried that that theme on with uh, in, in articulating all the things in his book that um, he's defined to bring a, a good DevSecOps process to, to fruition. Talked about policy a lot. So I think I think the first place I would start, and this is true pretty much in all organizations, if, if you don't have good support at the top of the organization and, and good understanding of the problem set, then nothing downstream is going to work very well. So I would start with making sure that our culture was changing to the point where we would accept some of these new ideas. And it's, it's not just um, stating the idea and saying this is the good way to go. I think you have to make a convincing argument. And I think Stephen and, and Carolyn both articulated a lot of the things that should be in that elevator speech to the senior leaders. Um, DevSecOps, you know, it's going to be about both consumers and producers. Most of the heavy lifting, I believe, is going to be done on the producer side. Um, and But that culture has to change as well because we're we're in a world that we, we've got a whole lot of history and background and, and things that have gone on. We've done things always this way, and that's not always a good way to do things in the future. But I would start by changing the culture and making sure you have a good policy which defines all of the things that you're going to need to be successful. And that would spawn good procedures on downstream and some of the things that Carolyn talked about. So that's where I would start. So um, I am so thrilled to be with the three of you today. And I want to thank each of you for your service. Um, I am the one on the panel who is not a veteran. Um, I my whole life have have experienced the benefits of living in this country and enjoying the freedoms and all of the all of the things that each of you have have made sure that I and my family have today. So I want to say a very heartfelt thank you. Um, with regards to first steps, I do think that it's important to acknowledge that for an organization that is not DevOps, that wants to be DevOps, it's super important to directly define what's the vision and what's the benefit. Because it's a very different model. It's a different business model. It's a different technology model. It's a different operating model. And so the organization has got to ask, why are we doing DevSecOps and what does it mean to us? There's got to be an evaluation of what do we have right now that is a good fit for how we want to manage things moving forward, and what do we need? Maybe we need to train folks on new skill sets. Maybe we need to bring in folks with specific skill sets that we don't have today. I think that with any sort of big transformational change like this, it's actually pretty normal for some folks to get a little worried. You know, oh, if we're changing from where we are today and we're doing something different tomorrow, where do I fit there? You know, and so I think that these are some of the cultural aspects that Ron was speaking to. You know, how do you create an opening for folks to come in to bring in new ways of thinking and new practices while at the same time saying to the folks who are on the team, look, you don't necessarily need to be scared for your job. Perhaps what this is, is a learning opportunity for you to add new skill sets and new ways of thinking to your resume, which will help you to actually become more marketable uh, in the future, you know, whether you stay at this organization or whatever, whatever happens down in your career. Um, the advice that I would give folks is, well, I'll, I'll say something that's a little bit um, that's a little bit snarky, which is that I think it's much easier, actually, for a company to go from not existing to starting in a DevOps model than for an established organization to change from not a DevOps model to a DevOps model. That being said, for those organizations that choose to do the latter, my recommendation is to start small. You don't have to boil the ocean in a day. You can start in one area and test things out and see how they're gonna work. And when things work well, expand those practices to other areas. When things don't go well, try to learn from them and try something different. Um, I do think that for organizations that are shifting um, to start small, 
and to iterate uh, is a good way to go. Yeah, I would probably I would probably second that definitely, Carolyn. But you know, when we when we think about how to get started and to just in DevOps, you know, particularly is again, it, it goes back to the culture. And I, I, I love this CAMS model because it talks about the requirement to create features, right? That's what software does. It enables people to, to enjoy life. It, it enables lots of different things, but it's number one, it's creating features, but also maintaining stability and security in the software that we're creating today. The other thing too is, is that DevOps is going to be a, a mind shift because it requires vast amounts of automation. And when we're talking about automation, automation not only in the security realm, which I had spoke about, but also in the development realm, you know, in the, the operations, the, the delivery, the deployment of the software. I mean, CICD is a fundamental practice inside of DevOps, and it must be embedded into that, into that thought process. Now, gets, this can be kind of scary when we talk about all of the tools and all the automation that must begin to be embedded and, and accepted. You know, one of the Biggest challenges I think organizations face is that when moving to DevOps, how much pushback am I going to get from the actual people that are developing the software, right? And so I've got to figure out a way to make their lives so much better and so much more pleasant so that the automation will be quickly accepted into their, into their realm. But also, I think there's some fear is because when we're talking about DevOps, there has got to be a measurement of metrics. How well are we doing? What are the metrics that we need to be tracking? And I think there's some fear sometimes, especially when we're talking about security and, and code vulnerabilities. What are my developers going to think when all of a sudden that we return them with a, a vulnerability report that says, hey, there's uh, thousands of vulnerabilities in the code that you've just uh, submitted to deployment? You know, I mean, do you think frustration is going to exist? And so we've got to, we got to overcome that. We have to, uh, you know, we have to get them ready for what's going to be coming. And then finally, sharing. The sharing is a big thing, you know, ideas, but also the problems that we're going to expect to experience and understanding, you know, what is, you know, what are the developers world? What is the operations lives like? What are the security team members and what are they challenged with? And then trying to figure out how are we going to adjust to that ratio of 100 developers to 10 operations personnel to one security person, right? And understanding that that automation is the key in sharing those ideas and really just kind of stepping in into each other's shoes. I do have some thoughts on best practices and it's not, these are not my thoughts, but I wanted to share them sometime during, during this. Uh, I, you know, I, I love to listen to the thought leaders out there and I like to repurpose some of their stuff, but giving them full credit for it. But uh, I do have some wonderful best practices to share with the listening audience if that question does come up with regards to best practices. Yeah, I, I think we can come back to the best practices and that would be a great way to close things out okay. as we draw near to the end. So if we can put a pin in that, that would be awesome. Uh, if Damian Suggs is still on the line, he did say that he wanted to jump in and didn't say what he wanted to say. So we'll give uh, Damien a chance to share his ideas. Just in terms of ground rules, ladies and gentlemen, all of your questions have to be ethical, legal, and moral, and this is a family show, so please don't get carried away. <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it over to Damien. <laughs> um, Mr. Suggs, you have the floor. We had to say all that. Let me turn off my camera and microphone then. I ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> No, I uh, no, I go back. Uh, I've been working in this field for 20 years now, and uh, actually, I started working with Keon at Center for Disease Control 20 some years ago, and um, I started in uh, pen testing for a long time, for about 10 years, and then I got into building out application security programs. Um, I did that, for, and I thought I did a really good job. I did that for eight years until I became a consultant. And I'm just coming off the road as a consultant. This is my second week at a uh, as a company, back in the trenches, building on an AppSec company, uh, building on an AppSec program for a company. And the one thing I've learned in the three years I was a consultant that just totally changed everything for me. And I think Keon knows exactly where I'm going. Is Open SAM using OWASP's Open SAM model has been unbelievably success successful. Uh, they just revamped to version 2.0 in February to include CICD uh, questions 
and I'm right now I'm going through the people in my new company. I'm I'm lining up interviews so I can put 25 people in all different areas, whether it be developers, leaders, executives, all through this open SAM interview, so I can understand what the company is doing right now. It's a new company, but I want to understand what their processes, practices are before I say anything. I, I don't say anything of, uh, as far as laying down the law, anything until I understand what's there. But also going through Open Sam, it's an eye opener. I can't tell you how many people as a consultant I've put through an Open Sam interview and they listen to the questions and they're like, you know, we're not doing that, but that is a great idea. And it's just one of those things on the road to maturity. And there's ideas involved. It's free. It's out there. And just if you run your company through a free open SAM interview of 25 people, put together the data, put it in a presentation, give it to the executives. You have a roadmap you can start building to get a mature application security program. That was my two cents. And thank you for the floor. Hey, thanks for your contributions, Damien. Um, for our panelists, do you guys have any feedback? I see some head shaking and some um, teeth shining with smiles. I suspect <laughs> that that is a good approach for people to get started with. I think that uh, that's a great approach. You know, one of the things uh, you have to win the hearts and minds before and everything else will follow after that. And this is a perfect way. Um, I haven't looked at that Open Sam interview yet, but I uh, thanks, Damien, for that suggestion. I'm going to check that out. As soon as this uh, uh, webinar is over, um, you know, I think the important concept there is it builds uh, a, a, the team concept. The integrated project team is something that goes back to, oh, it's it's an old concept. Uh, NASA used it and bringing all the different stakeholders to the table. But when you do that, these these are where the new ideas come about. And it's about taking ownership of the process. So it doesn't seem like we're pushing security onto the, the senior leaders. The security becomes part of the process. It adds value. And it can show them where it, it produces better products, uh, uh, products that we can trust. And that should be uh, a marketing factor for, for all the software developers. So I think that's a great idea. And again, it builds more cohesiveness and ownership of the process. And it gets gets back to what uh, Carolyn talked about is, is how do we how do we change the culture? Well, that, that's a good start. Cool. So it looks like Jennifer has been hanging out for a while with her hand up. I'll give her the floor for a second and then and then we'll keep rolling. I have. Um, thank you. So I'm Jennifer. I'm with PowerPlan. I'm the Director of Information Security and Compliance at, at PowerPlan, which is a software company um, based in Atlanta. Um, I completely agree with so many things you guys said. I've lived through some of what you're saying, and so I want to kind of highlight a couple things and maybe offer just some ways that I've been able to help shift the culture at our company. And then I do have a question at the end. So. A um, little bit of context at our company. I started our information security program about three years ago. We had never had one. The company is 25 years old and had never had a security program. So I was starting the program from scratch three years ago. Um, there was a lot to be done. Didn't even have information security policies when I started. Um, so in terms of the application security scanning, we, we didn't do application security scans either. So the way I was able to start that process is um, obviously got software and did scans, but we did more of what Caroline was describing, kind of the older methodology where we're doing like two releases a year on our older products, started doing the scans um, and started doing essentially informal internal audits, meaning me, I'm not an a formal auditor, I go through audits, but I've never been trained per se, um, started doing informal internal audits of the, the scan results and the remediation of the results. And I and actually before I audited, let me back up, I helped build out, I worked with the R&D team to build out a process to document the scan results and remediate and get the tickets created and all that. And then I did the informal internal audits. And I did that um, so that to help with the cultural aspect that Caroline was talking about. Um, and first of all, we did have executive support, thank goodness, but um, I, I basically worked with the R&D team to help them build out this process. Um, so it was more of a collaborative effort and I feel like that helped. And then and then I expanded from there and actually got us externally audited. We go through SOC 2 audits and I had it added into the SOC 2 audits as an additional control to be externally audited on our remediation of these scans. Um, the problem that we have is that we're still, we're shifted right right now and um, I want to shift left and we're actually starting that process now. 
how I was able to go from there and get the, the R&D team to start thinking about shifting left is I actually worked with them. I, I documented it, but I worked with R&D to develop, to document what our release process was, like developing the code, start of developing the code until it gets out the door into production. And when I started documenting that process, put it on paper, like on a Visio document, um, and again, I was working with the R&D team, getting their input and, and tweaking the process as we went. And they started to see when they saw it on paper, how we were shifted right. And how, gee, it would really be better if we started doing those security scans. We, we were doing them after we were releasing the code. <laughs> and so they started seeing how it's better to do it earlier in the process before we're releasing the code so that, of course, we can remediate before we release the code. Um, so going through that has been invaluable. Um, it's taken three years to get them finally on board with, with wanting to shift left. And then recently, I just got some real traction as well because I just kind of coincidentally, um, we have the security scanning tools that we already have, and I was getting a, a demo set up with another vendor um, to see what their tool offered. And, and I made a point of including R&D in those demos. And so then that really helped get them involved and engaged. And again, thinking about the idea of shifting left. And what came out of those demos is one of the developers just kind of went off and started integrating our existing security scanning tool with our um, with Azure DevOps that we're using um, so that we could start, start um, running those scans, you know, during the development process. We haven't actually done one yet because that's right at the point we're at now. But um, I guess, you know, kind of going back to the cultural aspect, my point is that really including R&D and working with them, um, not working in a silo is how you help shift that culture and get them, um, you know, aligned and, and working. Um, with all that being said, I have a question. So <laughs> now I'm at the point, um, it sounds like the next step that I also thought was the case is we need to document policies on um, what the requirements are for remediating these findings. Um, what is your advice for, you mentioned Stephen, um, like that, that we should develop a policy around what needs to be remediated. What is your advice on what you say, you know, put on paper as what you need to remediate? Is it like all criticals and highs need to be remediated or how do you define that? Do you have any well, advice there? Well, well, first off, let me let me kind of address Damien and your question at the same time, right? Because Damien talked about OpenSAM, right? And it's evaluating, the first step of OpenSAM is evaluating the dirty laundry of an organization, right? And, you know, where is the current security stance in the organization today, right? And that's challenging for a lot of people. And, you know, statistics that I've even read and, you know, I'm going to be releasing one, you know, sometime soon is that 75 plus percent of organizations out there are pushing vulnerable code to the wild. They're pushing it out, right? And, you know, they may either be aware of it, they may not be aware of it. Most likely they are aware of it, but they're making the decision is that time uh, over trumps or basically trumps or, you know, overrules, uh, you know, uh, security, right? And so, you know, when we're talking about um, shifting left, first, first off is that you're doing the exact right thing. Right, is shifting these tools right to the where the development process is. But when we're talking about what should be um, remediated first, first and foremost, I'm a big advocate of OWASP, OWASP top 10, right? Cross-site scripting, the, you know, the SQL injection, the cross-site request forgery. Those are so easy to exploit. The, it, it takes nothing to exploit those types of vulnerabilities, and those should be very high on the list, right? And also the fact that if you find a vulnerability, for example, you know, if we're, if we're using some open source, if there is a exploit in the wild, hey, if there is a known exploit in the wild, this must be remediated because it's somebody's going to stumble on it. When we're talking about all of the different types of bots that are out there today, and I, you know, I was in the world of cloud and web application firewalls and bot management and all the other stuff, the bots are getting increasingly smart. 
And what they will do is they will probe your applications that are sitting out there in the wild, looking to find these types of vulnerabilities. They raise the hand to the bot master and says, these guys are vulnerable, let's take advantage of them. And so OWASP is a great place to start, but that's not the only place to start. So addressing, from my personal opinion, is addressing the OWASP top 10 for web application security, but I was also a contributor on the OWASP top 10 for API. APIs are, are completely different types of risks and associated attacks, and associated vulnerabilities in the world of APIs. So today, the shift of the focus even has to go back to the APIs and what are, how am I using them? And when you start studying some of the API top 10, it's so interesting of how easy it is to exploit these API uh, risks and these API vulnerabilities. Because remember, when I'm, especially in the world of mobile apps, one of my, I think one of the most dangerous things is that when we're talking about mobile apps and I'm utilizing an API to you know, do my bank transactions or whatever, the application is relying on the mobile app to do the filter, right, of the actual, and, it's, and, and if I can actually manipulate the mobile app, I can actually now have the ability of, of exposing customer data that should have not, it should have been filtered upstream, but it's not, they're relying on the local app to do the filtering. And so again, those are areas where you've got to focus. What's exploitable? Assure that you adhere to the OWASP top 10, SANS 25, uh, the CVE 25 or CWE 25. And therefore, I think that, I think it's really about um, due care. If I know I'm following these various, uh, these various, you know, lists of risks and I'm addressing these first, then if somebody were to ever say, hey, you know, what'd you do? We did everything that was recommended by the industry. Does that does that help answer your question, Jennifer? It does. Yeah. I mean, we are doing those things. There, there's probably a little more work we could do, but certainly the OWASP top 10, we're, we're scanning for that. I guess I was wondering when you run the OWASP top 10, or, you know, should we be writing into the policy that we remediate the criticals and highs or, or even the lows as well? Well, I think, you know, the lows are there for one reason is because they're more difficult or they're less exploitable potentially, right? Or they're, you know, it's all based upon the tools that you're using and what, how they classify a low. One tool may classify a low differently than another tool, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think definitely criticals should definitely be looked at very, very closely. And then it's all about your risk. And then also an app analysis, looking at the application analysis, how the users are coming to the, you know, each application is going to operate a little bit differently. And so understanding the application, the risk of that application, what does it have access to? If it has access to PII data, then obviously it's a little bit higher risk on my on my food chain, right? And so looking at the various applications, looking at the risk each application is under, and then I would definitely say criticals first, highs if you can and then ensure that you're going to continue to improve so that you're going to have less and less and less criticals less and less highs then what you have is now time to go fix the mediums right and maybe some address some of the lows so these don't get uh embedded into the code as well hey caroline typed some great suggestions oh, in sorry. the chat for people who well, no, it's, I, th I love your insight and I think it adds a lot of value in case people weren't looking at the chat. I wanted everybody to know that there are some awesome points that are posted in there. And then um, Caroline, if you wanted to expand on that, I think this would be a great place to jump in and talk about the role that um, policy plays to answer some of the questions Jennifer asked. Sure. So um, I want to start by saying I completely agree with everything that Stephen said, um, and I have some additional comments to kind of layer and uh, you know kind of interweave through those thoughts um so totally agree a good focus is what's exploitable um and a good kind of guiding principle is do care um i think that uh it's straightforward to say criticals first and then highs and then mediums and then lows um but as you're kind of jennifer thinking through the practicalities of how you actually do that in your organization um in the chat i did share a few thoughts on uh, how you might uh, think through that. Um, so one item is, okay, if you're seeing some of the same defects happen over and over again, maybe that drives it to the top of the list. And in your policy, you say, if we, saw, if we see something happen over and over again, 
you know, some number of times, then it's got to be fixed and it's got to be fixed fast, whatever fast means to you, right? Maybe fast in one organization means within 24 hours, maybe in another organization, it means within seven days. Um, another one is, uh, again, something that Stephen spoke to, but I'll just put kind of a different lens on it, which is to say, we want to reduce the probability that attackers can cause critical applications to stop functioning. So we're looking at kind of two things here. What is the criticality of the particular vulnerability? We're also looking at what is the criticality of the application that we're talking about. So there's the target and then there's the vulnerability. And I think those two in combination, of course, give a very important context. So this assumes that your organization has done a risk ranking exercise across your software portfolio. Um, and then third, I think uh, we want to require fixes for bugs for which well-known attacks exist. So exactly to what Stephen was saying, what's exploitable, uh, the more well-known and exploited, maybe the faster we want to get that fixed. Um, so those are just a couple additional lenses to, to consider uh, as, you're, as you're thinking about writing these policies. I as well as getting buy into them, because sometimes <laughs> you can write a policy and then people are like, oh, blah, blah, the policy. Right. But but sometimes with these types of lenses, uh, you can actually get people to agree to the why behind the policy. Cool. So we have some great questions coming in the chat before we switch off a of policy. I saw Damien's hand shoot up. So Damien, I'll give you one more opportunity to contribute. And then um, there was a great question that was posted that I want to jump into next. Okay, I'll, I'll be quick. No, I just I was thinking about agree with everything Stephen said, and uh, but the one slam that I would have is a little bit different. This is something I see when I do a, a penetration test. It used to be for the longest time I ignored uh, lows and mediums, and I focused on the highs and criticals, and that was pretty much my focus. But I've learned kind of over the years to stop doing that. And I slap my hand. I look at the lows and I look at the mediums because the criticals are built on the lows. Like a lot of times you'll see a flag for a missing cross-site request forgery token. It's a low. But if you pay attention to that and you realize that's a control factor you need to embed in your application, you're not going to have that cross-site request forgery exploited as a critical later on. So those criticals are built off the lows. If you can look at the lows, attack those, put those those controls in place, your HTTP only, or you know, the, the, the small things that are, are brought out in lows, you won't have the criticals later on. I would I would agree 100% with uh, what you just said there, Damien. I mean, it's really, it's the approach, right? And, and when we're talking about, you know, we're doing application security testing, right? first off and we you know in the development process definitely address those criticals right because that's the best place to address them right because if i address them later after deployment what am i going to do right undeploy or you know am i going to break the build before i deploy so address those there and at the same time i agree 100 percent pay attention to those lows because they could be tied to something that could be much more critical so i i, I couldn't argue with that at all yeah, and as we shift the conversation, Adam has posted two great questions in the chat, kind of a combination of question and combination of comment. But the thing that I wanted to focus on, and this is a question to all the panelists. So again, we'll start with Ron, we'll go to Caroline, and then we'll go to Stephen. But Adam, and I'll read it out loud for those who aren't looking at the chat, shifting left offers significant gains in not just secure code and in reduction of potential exposure points, but also reduction in development costs. Do the panelists have any lessons learned or cost analysis that they can point to relative to migrating towards the shift left movement with the quantifiable productivity and cost improvements? And so now we're getting into how does the shift left thing actually work rather than being a concept and a theory? How are you guys seeing this happen in practice? And are there any metrics, tangible results or cost benefit findings that you can share with the group. And Ron, since you are our resident expert in all <laughs> things NIST, I think it would be a good place to, to start with and then we'll go down the line. I'm going to be very brief on this one because uh, we don't really have any statistics per se, but I can tell you that um, if you implement all of the best practices that uh, Stephen uh, and Carolyn talked about, just by definition, you're going to reduce the number of weaknesses and deficiencies in the code that you're gonna to have to come back later and clean up. 
And, and that may be the good news part of the story. If those end up getting out to the customer side, then they're going to have to deal with those as vulnerabilities. So uh, I think by definition, and it sounds kind of counterintuitive because we're talking about a lot of new processes and, and approaches and, and ways to, to do business during that life cycle development. It may seem like it's adding cost and it's adding more work, but in the end, it's all about reducing the number. Of, it's building better code and building better systems. And that, by definition, is going to be more cost effective. But I think I'll cede the rest of my time back over to Carolyn and Stephen, who are the experts in this area. So there are um, two sort of uh, pieces of data that I've seen referenced in this particular conversation. Uh, and I'm like rapidly Googling for them right now. Um, I posted one in the chat. Um, it's by the IBM System Science Institute. You know, they have some data that says, oh, you find stuff earlier, you fix it. It's cheaper than finding it later. The other one that I find to be um, typically referenced is by this gentleman named Barry, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Boehm, B-O-E-H-M. Um, so I'll pull that up and, and paste it in as well. I think that in my experience, people say it a lot and then they point to one of these two references and then and then organizationally the culture either accepts it or not. Um, I think that to me, while I think that shift left is a useful model, I don't think it's perfect. I don't think it's a one size fits all. I don't think that just by shifting left, you're necessarily gonna save a ton of money. I think that actually that Shift left has become a really useful marketing statement, and it's super convenient for a lot of security vendors to say shift left and we can do it for you, which is totally cool, you know. Um, but I do think that if I take a step back from shift left, which in my view is a little oversimplified, I think that fundamentally what it's about is you're trying to find problems you're trying to fix those problems and you're trying to prevent those problems. And I think that the idea of shifting left is one component of that, but what's actually more important, I think is understanding in your organization's software development methodology, how can you effectively find, fix, and prevent problems? At what points in the software development life cycle does it make the most sense for your organization to do that right now? It may be different to say, what can we do and what should we do right now than aspirationally, what would we like to do in three to five years from now? And I think that's where this concept of strategy, which Keon so eloquently defined for us at the beginning of today's session really comes into place. So um, I will uh, shortly be posting that second uh, Barry Boehm uh, thing that people point to often uh, in the chat so that folks can have access to it. Well, excellent. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more with you, Carolyn, and and the, especially with the, the term shift left. I personally don't even like the term, and and I think it was probably invented by some marketing person somewhere in the world. It wasn't me. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. But the whole concept is is that when we're thinking about the earliest stages of development, right, and and basically the earliest stages of conceptualizing a project, right and building these user stories into the project of saying, okay, you know, let, let's begin the actual security thought process before I even start writing the first line of code. But then once the code begins to be constructed and being built, and today, no single, single developer has got all lines of code sitting in front of them at any given time, because these applications today could have millions and millions of lines of code. So they're working primarily in branches of code. And these branches of code they're working in have not necessarily gone into a merge or build process yet, right? Because they're fixing something, they're enhancing something, and you have multiple developers running on multiple branches. And, you know, obviously you have the main branch, the secure branch, the reliable branch, but while they're developing these other branches, it, like it could be a, a, a bug fix, it could be enhancement or something, and they're, you know, they're coding then, it would make all the sense in the world to run an application scan, a security scan, looking for OWASP top 10, looking for, you know, 
to, to SANS uh, top 25, right in the IDE, right in the developer IDE. So then once the developer is ready to, uh, you know, does a scan, it says, or, or he does a scan there, or he or she does a scan there, what is the next kind of stage, right? Well, they're working inside of the actual SEM tools and they do a basically a pull request. And they do a pull request for that branch to be merged into either a subsidiary branch or a main branch. And at that point in time, a scan should take place. Because if the scan can take place, that is one of the farthest left as well as you could possibly get. And once that scan take place, then all of a sudden, the, the developer receives these results back as comments right in the tool they're using and says, that needs to be fixed. This has happened before the merge and building takes place. That is really, really, really far left. And then of course, once I do my merge and I do my build and you know, in the CI process, running a scan across the whole, you know, basically the full, full code base at that point in time. But there's different places that I need to do these scans. And the whole idea is, is that, you know, they're also they're, the, the whole concept of integrating the ticketing, the feedback loop, you know, tracking the bug tracking of all of this is very, very important as well. But the whole idea is, is that by the time this code, it's almost kind of like a, a train rolling down the tracks, right? By the time it gets to its destination, it wants to be at full speed, right? And, you know, at, or as it's approaching its destination, it starts slowing down, obviously. But it wants, we can't slow down the process during, and we can't allow, you know, security to slow down this DevOps process. There are sort of very, very strategic places inside of the dev circle, so to speak, of where various tools come into play. SAST is a great tool very, very early on. Software composition analysis, very, very important to do there as well. Either dynamic application security testing or IaaS testing during functional testing or you know in the QA stage makes 100% sense. But I'm also very, um, I'm an advocate of penetration testing after deployment. I think I think it's a very important component, right? And especially when we're looking at some of the penetration tools out there, penetration testing tools, but also the penetration testing skill set. There are some really, really good pen testers out there today, and they will find the needle in the haystack that some of the other tools may not have found along the way. So is there one tool that will fix everything? I don't necessarily believe that, but hopefully I cleared up the shift left a little bit and tried to like, you know, take away the whole marketing aspect of what shift left is actually about. Hey, Kian, could I, I just forgot to mention uh, when Carolyn was doing her, her Google search, uh, I'm an old guy, so I don't do those Google searches <laughs> as fast as she does. I have to rely on my old memory. Uh, but I was thinking the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon, they have a whole group up there that has a, a wonderful repository of data, empirical evidence of, of uh, software development costs and, and the, the cost of the vulnerabilities that are in uh, in in code, so that's another source that, that folks can go to. And the only other comment I was going to make is, you know, today we're still talking about software, and one of the things we'd like to do at the DevSecOps uh, project at NIST is to look at the system. Our 800-160 publication addresses both software and systems engineering uh, concepts, and how security gets built into both. So. Everything Stephen was talking about when he talked about the pull from a, a developer that's working on a particular branch of the code that's part of a larger uh, uh, software entity, so to speak. Well, that software entity then goes into a system. It becomes one element in the system. And adversaries work across the entire stack from the applications to the middleware to the operating system down to the firmware and the integrated circuits. So we, even if we do everything right in that world of software development, we still have to address the larger systems context because that's where a lot of the adversaries bear in because they'll find the weak point in that system versus the individual applications, even if we do a great job there. Especially when we're talking about cloud native, right? And this whole new exactly. approach to cloud native. We're talking about microservices and serverless and we're talking about APIs. And we're, you know, these are yep. little pieces of code. Right. And right. you can't really put them all together in one place at any one given time to basically run a scan of everything, right? And they, right. not only are they physically distributed, they're logically distributed all over the planet, literally today. And so I think the, the, the best approach is to deal with the pieces, right? Find the vulnerabilities in the pieces. And then um, there's, some, there's some really, really great research that's going on. And there's some great so solutions that are coming out that can help address the, the whole cloud native world as well. 
Yeah, I saw some of my students were part of the session today, and any of them can tell you that I make all of them read that NIST 800-160 <laughs> because the results of the 800-160, when you do system security engineering properly, is a documented level of trustworthiness. Yeah. How to be able to process or transmit whatever information I have at the security rating or at the designation that it's supposed to be, and that confidence that you get from formally documenting it and understanding everything adds a lot of value to the process. Yeah, no um, doubt. As we, no doubt. As we continue the conversation, uh, I'm excited to see that Cal was able to join us today. So Cal, if you want to jump in, uh, wh whatever drew you to raise your hand, I would love to hear your thoughts. And if you can tell the audience a little bit about why I think that it's so awesome that you did raise your hand. <laughs> you know, who are you? <laughs> what do you bring into the table? And we'd love to hear your question. He's probably waited so long that he stepped away to get coffee after that fabulous <laughs> introduction. <laughs> When, hold on now, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you clear. Sorry, I was on mute. Talking away here, nobody can hear me. Um, so I, I've been in this business for a very long time, like some of the others. I've got nice white hair for being around for more than 40 years doing this stuff. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think has been missed to date when we talk about the shift left is it's a cultural thing to really think about. When you treat it, catch it late in the game, you are getting somebody finding the problem and going back to the programmer and saying, go fix this. And you made a mistake, right? And people don't react well to that as well as they should. Secondly, if it's shift left and you find your own mistake, you get to fix it. Nobody knows that you've made that mistake. You feel good about that. And it becomes embedded in you over time, right? Now, when you think about the cost associated with that, none of your programmers only own one piece of code. They own lots of pieces of code. And odds are the mistake they made once, they have successfully duplicated time after time <laughs> after time after time. Right. So when you get them to fix something and they relearn it, they go back and fix it elsewhere. And one of the fascinating things that I can recall from my old days is that everybody remembers the Microsoft blue screen of death. Right. And it turns out that 20 percent of those major outages were caused by one programmer. He made the mistake multiple times over that killed their system frequently. So if you can correct this and you shift left, you're not only solving a problem for a one-off challenge here, but you're ingraining in the programmers how to do things right. This becomes an educational piece, particularly if you've got your software tools when you run them and it says, here's the mistake and here's the line and here's how you fix it. And they bother to read what the CVE is, the CWE is that they're fixing. So they understand not to fix it, make that mistake again. You've really made great progress. And so that that cost savings and the value of that is far greater than the one bug that was caught in that cycle. I could. I concur 100%. There's nothing more embarrassing, right, for a developer that all of a sudden gets a whole list of vulnerabilities. And remember, these developers work together. They know what's going on, especially when they're dealing with all the same similar very ticket ticketing systems and whatnot. And so, Cal, I, I agree 100% is that it allows to the developer to discreetly fix their vulnerabilities without anybody necessarily knowing, right? And they can uh, basically fix it right there. It doesn't necessarily even have to open up a ticket. It, they're meaning, hey, they got their scan. The ticket doesn't even have to be open. Nobody else knows it. The AppSec team doesn't know it. The DevOps teams doesn't know it. They're fixing it right then and there. And you're 100%. That's 100% true is, is that they're less likely to replicate that error again. And so giving them that direct feedback immediately while they're coding is I, I, I think is imperative. It's it's crucial. 
You know, Stephen, you mentioned earlier uh, that really uh, dovetails nicely on your earlier comment about uh, in the Army, and Kian, he know this as well, there's a saying, we, we fight as we train. And I think your comment about having uh, skilled uh, developers, and that requires the training and education as part of that process, if that can be built into the development process like you, you uh, talked about earlier, that means that's really a cultural shift. That, that, that rewards them for uh, doing things right, but that, that it's not a negative. It's part of the way they do business. You're expected to build code a certain way, but you're being trained as you're trying to bring that new thinking into the process. It becomes a, a, a part of the culture. And when you get to that point, you're then working as a team and 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 that i think will permeate across uh, the entire organization it, it's uh i i recall when i was in the army i had uh, uh we used to get ratings all the time and one of the ratings that uh, the battalion commander gave he said uh, this second lieutenant um never makes the same mistake twice but he's made all of them at least once so <laughs> you know it, it's kind of that kind of mentality absolutely absolutely and you guys touched on training, which was one of the questions that I was going to use for our closing statements. Um, I think my understanding from the conversation is that if you're going to do training right, it's less about having a structured program for people to go to class and sit down. But to Stephen's point is that as soon as the mistake is identified, the person who made the mistake is informed. What was the nature of the mistake? What's the impact? How do you fix it? And then you start to internalize, hey, this is what I was doing wrong and I don't want to keep doing things wrong and I'm discreetly learning what is the right, right way to do things. So there's just part of my practice rather than being a separate session that I'm set up to do. Since we addressed the training question, I think the question that will lead us to the finish line is related to what Clyde posted in the chat talking about silos. You know, based on academic research, and all of the things that people say on paper about doing DevOps and injecting security into your DevOps strategy, it requires an integrated team, but lots of development teams currently already work in silos. And so if you're gonna go from a silo approach to an integrated approach, that's going to be a requirement. If you're gonna do DevOps successfully and security is gonna to have to be integrated into the development process, which means now security people are gonna to have to hang out with the developers and they all speak different languages, they have different approaches, they have different concerns. And so if we start with Ron and we go down the road with our panelists, driving us towards the finish line, I would love to hear some of your thoughts about you know, how do we break down silos? How do we integrate teams? How do we get people to work together on the same sheet of music, dancing the same dance, at the same speed so that it looks like a great drill and ceremony presentation in honor of Veterans Day <laughs> rather than chaos like you're at a rave and everybody's jumping around. Boy, Kian, you really know how to frame that uh, that question to, to, to make it very appropriate for Veterans Day. Uh, I think this is one of our, our biggest challenges. Uh, I, I look back over my 30 years and uh, going back 40 years when cybersecurity uh, first started, maybe even further than that. It's always grown up in a silo. It's always been security professionals trying to push their work on, on the organization, on the development team, always the outsiders coming in. And I think a lot of the things, uh, part of it's our fault because everything looks like a security problem in, in, in our world. And I think if we were to just to capture the discussion today, things that Stephen and Carolyn talked about, Really, most of our security problems come from, from the development practices that we uh, have chosen to follow. Uh, I think many, many of our, our security vulnerabilities that, that come to the customers, the consumers, if we were to do um, even 50% of the things we talked about today, that number would drop dramatically. But it's gonna require the security professionals not thinking them as themselves as being special because we've created the stovepipe. We have to. I think it's a mindset shift on our part. We have to go back and, and, and know that we are just part of the overall process. We're part of the overall team that's supporting a business operation or a mission, whatever it might be. And we're contributors to that integrated project team instead of making it all about us all the time. I kind of equate it to, I've, I've started literally a hundred diets in my, in my lifetime that, that started on Friday and ended on Monday morning or started on Monday and ended on Tuesday. And I didn't realize that it's a change in lifestyle, the way you eat and all the things that have to change the way you, you live your life. And that's really what contributes to a real weight loss long-term. We're gonna have to do the same thing for security. We're gonna change our, our mindset 
and and start to do some of the things that uh, the, uh, the other panelists talked about today. So I think uh, I, I've just I've learned a lot today and uh, I've uh, I'm just excited about the next steps that we'll be taking at NIST to really d dive into this world of DevSecOps and, and, and really try to uh, define and move some of these concepts forward for our customers. Awesome, Ms. Wong. So, um, I, you know, I've I've come from the security mindset, and I think that it's super important for security people to remember that engineers are the product owners. Security should really play a role that's more like a service provider, you know, providing advice and guidance and support, but not actually owning the product security. And so for this to work, a product security culture has to shift to make sure that engineering actually gets the necessary support to resolve, you know, problems and also questions uh, when they come up. So I'll, I'll give a, an example and it's kind of a pen test based example. So um, something that doesn't work super well in DevOps is a typical penetration testing scenario where you've got, you know, a product is pen tested, results are delivered in a PDF. Uh, in my experience, uh, sometimes when engineers receive instructions via PDF or, or requests <laughs> via PDF, uh, those get ignored. Um, uh, and then, and then, so you know, you get a security gets a PDF from this pen test company, and then they and then they forward the results to engineering, maybe with not very much prioritization or guidance and then and then security follows up by email periodically to say hey have you fixed that yet have you fixed that yet you know and and, and engineering is thinking uh you know we've got like real things to do uh, i don't have time for your you know pdf reports that that make no sense to me so so what do we do instead right i think that it's so important for folks to talk to each other i think it's so important for for example pen testers to be able to ask developers directly about a product's intended use cases. I think it's really important for developers to be able to ask questions about security issues that are raised. I think it's important for pen testers to be able to advise on how to actually fix some of these security issues and security to provide guidance on, you know, which issues ought to be prioritized. Um, I think it's important for engineering to be able to ensure that patches and fixes are actually effective by asking pen testers to retest patched issues. So it's a different mentality. It's not a I'm telling what to, you to, I'm telling you what to do mentality and I'm checking on you. It's it's a two-way continuous conversation. Um, that is is what I understand uh, to be a good way to to break down silos. And this has to this has to come, to, these things don't just happen naturally. They don't happen magically. You know, they have to happen because somebody created the process and the structure for cross-functional communication on purpose um, and with uh, sort of the needs of the different groups in mind. Um, I also want to just say it has been such a pleasure uh, to speak with all of you today. Um, what a what a fun conversation. Uh, it is such a delight to interact with such extremely smart and experienced folks. Uh, and so just thank you everyone for coming together and making this happen. Awesome, Stephen, and then um, we'll give Cal the floor for one more item and then we'll close out. Awesome, awesome. So I figured I'd give you a little bit of a military analogy, right? So um, I went in early in the 80s and uh, I was in a Blackhawk unit the uh, whole time I was I was in, in the military in the 10 years. But the, the funny thing was, is back in the, our day in the military, and I'm not 100% sure how it is today, but we were, we were, we were forced to cross train. We needed to know what everybody else's job was about, right? And so I went in as a logistics and I became a nuclear biological chemical, uh, you know, uh, company expert. So I knew everything about, you know, gas masks and all those, you know, the test kits and all the other stuff. Then, you know, I was working in the motor pool. I'm pulling truck tires that are bigger than me, right? Off of these big five ton units. Um, I was in, you know, communications uh, within our unit. And, you know, I was a unit armor. Uh, as well, small arms specialists, and uh, even a door gunner and a Blackhawk, you know, dropping Rangers, right? And and you know, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, training uh, training uh, locations that we were training together, and and dropping, you know, 
Rangers inside of uh, inside of hot zones, although they weren't necessarily real hot zones. We were doing a lot of training back in those days. But you started to really understand and, and live in each person's shoes a little bit when you experienced their world and and you sort of understood their world a little bit closer. I think you had a lot more appreciation for what their role in the military was. And again, we did tons and tons of cross training. But, you know, tying that kind of back to the world of, of dev and ops, certainly, you know, one of the best practices is to basically, you know, take, uh, you know, three devs and put one operations person with them, right? So that they understand. And I'm basically put them in the same area of work. When we, of course, when we all work together in, inside of offices, that was very common, right? Because it was a way to sort of break down the barriers so that people could understand each other's roles. And back to your point, Carolyn, you know, I mean, giving them the PDF normally doesn't necessarily improve anything. Um, living in their shoes on a daily basis, I think they have much more appreciation. Plus, you build camaraderie. Uh, you know, at the back to Ron's point, you know, building the camaraderie amongst the team so that each person knows how important they are to the end result. I think that's that's critical. And I just want to again say thank you so much for having me on here. Um, this is not something I normally do, um, but I certainly enjoy doing it. Yeah, we're glad you could join us. Um, Cal, real quick, we'll give you a chance to um, jump in as the wisdom in the group. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Reminded me that I uh, mentioned I'm also a vet. I served in the Navy for a number of years and um, worked at Fleet and, Fleet and America Weather Central, where we published all the maps for the Navy globally. So that was always a fun thing to do. Um, and I have been uh, working with large accounts all my life, the high end systems, whether the, the New York Stock Exchange or the airline systems globally. And now I'm, I'm executive uh, director of research for the Robert, Fran Robert Francis Group. And we have been working for the last six years with the largest financial services firms as they've tried to move to the cloud and help provide them direction and how to solve some of their problems. And DevSecOps has been one of the issues that we have been focused on over the last few years. And one of the key elements that I have found is that people got stuck, right? The progress moved and then it sort of sat still and they weren't moving anywhere. And one of the things that we found, and, and it took me a while to get people to finally own up to it, is that they weren't measuring progress. Okay? They, they did it and there was success or lack of success, but no one was really documenting where they were, how successful they were, what their metrics were, what their KPIs were, what the challenges were. And if you're going to succeed with any project, particularly I think as Carolyn pointed out, there's a need to pilot it and extend it through. Well, if you're gonna pilot something, people are gonna wanna know you're successful. And if you can't demonstrate your successes, nobody else in the company is gonna buy in. So you've got to be able to document what you're doing. And, ex and obviously if you've got areas that are problems, you can at least now know what your challenge point is and try and get over those. But until you put your metrics around that and can prove where you're going, the probability of you being able to succeed across the board and rolling it out across the company and getting people to give up their old way of working in a waterfall basis to moving to a DevSecOps is going to be a struggle. So metrics and, and um, actually making the project really measurable is is extremely important as you move it forward i i think that was a great addition metrics is my soapbox item so the next um executive roundtable that we do might be focused on metrics and you might see cal featured as one of our speakers as we get really really close to the finish line and we're about to run across the tape one of the things that I do want to do, you know, we spent the entire session talking about Veterans Day. And so again, I do want to honor all of the veterans who are here, whether you listen live or you're listening to the recording. I take Veterans Day very seriously. It's up there with Memorial Day and Independence Day and Christmas and my birthday. <laughs> and in that order, you know, we want to make sure that things are set up properly. But um, as we close out, what I do want to do is also recognize that our sponsors Cobalt Labs and check marks, and we're still considering NIST a sponsor, are who made this possible. And so as we close, going in the same order that we've been going in, if Ron, if Caroline, and if Steven can say in a minute or less, 
you know, what is the best tool that your company is going to offer that's going to help solve the problem that we've talked about today? I think that's a great way to close things out, to recognize the support that your companies have provided and to set everybody up for success so that they know why they want to reach out to you to follow up and continue the conversation. Well, thank you, Kian, uh, for giving us the opportunity today to uh, to be with all of our, our veterans out there and, and all the people on the call, and I've enjoyed this th thoroughly. Uh, from this perspective, our, our I guess our gift to everybody is taxpayers. You, you've, I work for you. You've paid my salary, and, and we have a tremendous website out there. It's csrc.nist.gov, and that's the home page for all of our standards and guidelines. Uh, obviously, people go to look at 853 Revision 5, just published uh, a couple of months ago. But I guess one of my uh, proudest uh, accomplishments at NIST is the, as you mentioned, 80160 document. That's a, a great resource for system security engineers. It, it's based on an international standard, and, and I think that's going to be the key or one of the keys to starting to solve some of these really difficult and challenging problems that we, we've we been talking about today with complexity and building security into life cycles and reducing the number of vulnerabilities. But uh, that's uh, that website, uh, everything out there is, is free of charge, and I recommend everybody take a look at it. Thanks again for having me today. Thanks, Ron. Caroline? So Cobalt.io is a pen test as a service company. We do pen testing for DevOps organizations. So we do web, mobile, cloud, network, API. Um, and the whole thing about our model is that it's on demand. If you need a pen test and you need it right now, we can get it started for you in 48 hours. Um, I'll, I'll post a little thing in the chat so that folks can take a look. Um, thanks so much, uh, Keon and all. Uh, this was so much fun today. Hey, I'm glad you could be here. It is a pleasure to have you party with us for another Cyber Strategy Retreat event. And Stephen, um, tell us a little bit about Checkmarks and the awesomeness that you guys bring. Yeah, so Checkmarks, we, uh, we've been in business uh, for about 16 years. Uh, we were a pioneer in the application security uh, testing realm, right, with our, our static application security testing solution. We've also got software composition analysis solutions, um, interactive uh, application security tests, and that's the IaaS. And then finally, we've got a product called Code Bashing, which is really about the integrated gamified training that I kind of kept, you know, talking about because, you know, with the measurements, actually, I wrote a blog around this and uh, it was a university professor who actually used it inside of his classroom and proved that the retention rate uh, was so much higher when you're using the simulated simulated solution for, for you know, AppSec training. And um, we're a leader in, uh, in, the, in Gartner Magic Quadrant for AST for multiple years. And I just want to thank everybody, the listening audience, especially um, without the listening audience, uh, we would have all been talking to ourselves today. So definitely appreciate the listening audience and uh, certainly love to be part of this panel and Ken for uh, putting this all together. Just great stuff. Part of our strategy is to bring good content to the world. And so I'm glad that our executive roundtable was valuable. I see some great comments in the chat. If you guys need help building your security strategy, we would love to have a conversation with you. We don't do any technical work, but I know some great people at Cobalt Labs and at Checkmarks that can help you with the technical stuff. And we also do training. And so there was a mention about training and we're not focused on DevOps training, but if you want to take entry level people or senior executives and have them understand how do we do all the things that we've talked about in practice, we're gonna be a great partner for you. We are also gonna be a great partner at our next cyber strategy retreat event. Our live conference will be in Atlanta in July, 2021. The date is still to be determined, but the conference will be live and in Atlanta, and we're also gonna multicast it. We're also working with Sightline Security that I wanna give a plug to because they are not supporting veterans, but they dedicate a lot of resources to nonprofit organizations, and we're doing a benefit with them in March, the day before St. Patrick's Day, so you can donate money on Tuesday and then party on Wednesday, and it'll be a great way to spend a week. On behalf of Class LLC, Cobalt Labs, Checkmarks, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your feedback that I hope to hear from you in the future, and I look forward to seeing you at the next event.